74 years ago this July, the very first nuclear weapon was tested not far from Alamogordo, New Mexico, 120 miles south of Albuquerque. It was the technological achievement of 130,000 people, $2 billion, and four years of effort. Although classified for many years, the details of the inner working have been made public since. But this is not another video about the physics and engineering of the gadget. This is a nuclear forensic study seven decades after the blast. So in this video, I'll analyze a small sample of Trinitite and try to reconstruct some of the detail of the very first nuclear blast in history. So Trinity was the code name for the test and the greenish glassy sand left all over the site after the blast was uh, given the name of uh, Trinitite. Although perfectly legal to own and, and purchase, it is illegal to uh, pick it off the ground. If anyone can figure that one out, uh, let me know in a comment. Anyway, this sample came from uh, United Nuclear and even have a certificate of authenticity. The radiation sign is a bit overkill considering how weak the radioactivity of this sample is. And to prove it, I first ran a gamma spectrum with my sodium iodide detector and clearly cesium-137 pops up very quickly. I could even use it to calibrate my instrument in the future. And I calculated the activity for cesium to be somewhere around 290 back holes for this sample. Now switching over to X-ray spectrum, americium-241 is very clearly visible here and some trace amount of americium-243 as well. Now the cesium I expected but I was a bit surprised and suspicious to find this much americium. So it was time to investigate further and run the sample through the mass spectrometer. So just like with my previous uh, analysis videos, the sample had to be crushed and uh, digested because of the high content of uh, silicate, hydrofluoric acid works best, and in conjunction with uh, nitric acid dissolve most metals pretty well. Oh, and since we're dealing with interesting substances, let me just give this quick tip. Here's the way to take off contaminated gloves. With one hand, pinch the outside of the glove in the wrist area and turn it inside out like so. Then run your free thumb inside the other glove and do the same thing to keep both gloves rolled up inside out. After several hours of digestion, I ran the analysis first to see what was detectable and in what quantity. And I also ran the isotope uh, ratio analysis. The idea is to prove the presence of uh, some isotopes in unnatural ratio, indicating fission product input. So gallium give me some hit, which is uncommon in the desert of uh, New Mexico. Uranium-238 clocked in at 26 ppb, cesium at 26 ppb also, molybdenum at about 9, and palladium at 24. Much to my chagrin, I do not have a plutonium standard, but the detector picked up 30,771 hits at mass 239 for plutonium which definitely qualify as a full-grown detection well above the noise. The isotopic ratio reveals some surprise too. Molybdenum as well as palladium and zirconium to some degree also show what can only be explained as fission product decay input. Due to isobaric interference with uh, molybdenum, I failed to detect any technetium which account for almost 6% of all fission product or any of the barium isotopic imbalance I was looking for. To be fair, I have no idea where the sample was picked up from. And the location does matter. When the nuclear weapon goes off, the temperature rises instantly to several hundred million degrees and cools in two to three seconds down to about 2000 degrees or so. That's when the refractory and volatile elements separate. Ruthenium, molybdenum, rhodium, etc followed by iodide, cesium, and xenon, the more volatiles which disperse further from the blast carried by the mushroom cloud. So naturally, differences in isotopic ratio can be expected from an upwind sample and a ground zero sample or a downwind sample. Precisely for that reason, cesium cannot be used to estimate the yield of the weapon and for dating the age of the blast. I did not expect to be able to detect plutonium, much less being able to perform an isotopic ratio. Based on uranium calibration and detector count and assuming similar properties, I can estimate the concentration of plutonium around 1 ppb. Too much plutonium for uranium bomb. Combined with the presence of gallium, we have a strong case for a plutonium device. The detection of uranium prover temper was used. 
the ratio of americium-241 over plutonium-241 could tell us the age of the detonation. Taking advantage of the short half-life of plutonium-241 and the estimated amount of americium-241, I calculated the age of the blast, assuming all americium-241 came from plutonium-241. This ratio gives me an estimated age of 20.6 years, which is off by 50. So either I detected too much plutonium or not enough americium, or both. Knowing where and how the sample was collected could help we find the dating. But this is the right order of magnitude, so the math and the analysis were done correctly, at least. Many other ratios and techniques are available to the nuclear forensic investigator. Too many for this video. But if you are interested, I'll leave my data and some interesting read in the link below. I had a great time analyzing this trinitite. It challenged my knowledge of the instrument and made me dig deeper in the field of nuclear forensic science. Anyway, I must thank my Patreon for the support. Thank you. So don't forget to subscribe, thumbs up if you like it, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.